So the conference organizers asked me to present uh, a topic that has uh, nuanced decision making, conflicting literature, and uh, quite a varied interpretation of what to do in 15 minutes. So thrombolysis of PE in 2018, they asked Himmel, he said he needed 25 minutes. They asked Matu, he said he needed 20. I said I'd do it in 15. So this is a difficult decision making process to decide what to do with a clot that is causing a patient to be unstable. And I talked up here three years ago about how to do this. And um, we were developing at that time an algorithm on how to deal with these patients at London Health Sciences Center. And we've finalized that algorithm. So I've put that in your conference materials. So I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about that, but it has dosing and it has uh, the sort of algorithm and the thought process that we're talking about today. And that's in your conference materials. Uh, no conflicts of interest. We're gonna discuss decision making and dosing in arrest, massive PE, and spend most of our time on submassive PE, which is where the literature continues to evolve. And after this, you're gonna know your shit. You're, uh... <laughs> so why do we consider lysis for PE? There, when you're looking at all this literature, keep in mind that there's really just two reasons why we want to give someone a thrombolytic when they're having their PE. We'd like to prevent death, and we'd like to prevent dyspnea. So there's a lot of other sort of surrogate things that we talk about, but when we're talking about present, preventing death, only about 2.5% or 1 in 40, maybe 1 in 30, patients with a submassive PE actually go on to die. So we're actually pretty good even with no thrombolytic therapy at treating these patients, and the risk of death is small enough that you need a pretty large study to show mortality benefit. There are other surrogate markers which people talk about which can be impacted by thrombolytics, length of stay in ICU, RV strain, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, recurrent VT. These things all can be impacted by thrombolytics, but really we're trying to prevent the patient either from dying or having chronic shortness of breath a year or two later. And keep that in mind as well when we're talking about the evidence. Now, this is just a random person uh, who presented with shortness of breath. You can see that he's dyspneic. And uh, uh, you can see he's struggling to breathe, obviously. We'll just call him Anil for, okay? So Anil presents with uh, uh, chest pain and shortness of breath three weeks after giving a talk in China. He's a closet smoker. Uh, he's tachycardic with a heart rate of 132, his blood pressure is 70 on 55, his SAT's 86% on room air. Repeat blood pressure uh, done after he gets into a room, after uh, his triage vitals continues to be low. So this, the decision making in this case is pretty easy. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, okay? This guy is sick. Uh, this is his point of care ultrasound. You can see on the screen right, his RV is quite a bit bigger than his LV. He's got RV strain. This guy has a massive PE. So, as I said, all the societies, CHEST, the American College of Cardiology, the um, European societies, they all agree that this person should receive thrombolytics. Definition of massive PE, sustained hypotension for greater than 15 minutes. Uh, bradycardia and shock is also in there. And if you know their baseline blood pressure, if they have a substantial sustained drop, from their baseline blood pressure, that can be considered a massive PE also. So these patients, they receive thrombolytics. This is pretty standard dosing too. 10 milligrams of alteplase push, 90 milligrams over two hours. There's a weight-based dosing. It's 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. As I said, the dosing is on that algorithm that I've put in your files. Um, heparin is administered. We're gonna talk a little bit about how to heparinize these people. Controversial. Uh, low, dose heparin, low dose alteplase is also studied, and some people recommend it in these patients. So 50 milligrams of alteplase, or the half dose or safe dose, dosing of alteplase, was studied in 2010 in a Chinese study where they put, uh, took just over 100 patients, they gave half the full dose, 100 milligrams, half 50 milligrams, and they found similar outcomes and similar benefit with both dosing strategies. It hasn't been replicated in this population. The standard dosing recommendation is still recommended to be uh, 90 milligrams over two hours after the 10 milligram push. However, if the person has a higher bleeding risk, 
This study found substantially lower bleeding, as have all the others with half-dose alteplase in the half-dose strategy. So you may consider people who have higher bleeding risk, you might consider giving them alteplase 50 milligrams instead. And one of the things that we did in our algorithm is we actually organized giving people who are um, getting half-dose uh, alteplase, giving them 10 milligrams push and 40 milligrams over one hour, that allows us to give them 50 milligrams, reevaluate them. If they continue to be sick, you can give the other 50 milligrams then. But if they're improving and they're having benefit already, then you may decide to hold off and reduce your risk of intracranial hemorrhage and major bleeding, which is substantial. Catheter-directed thrombolysis is, is uh, another uh, entire sort of topic, but the, the very brief summary on that is uh, the data seems promising that catheter-directed thrombolysis or interventional radiology can reduce your risk of bleeding with um, uh, administering alteplase. What they do is they just drip in a milligram per hour of alteplase directly into the clot. Seems to make sense that you're using low dose, administering it directly to the lungs. You have less bleeding, but all of the study data is poor quality. They're all single arm studies. No one's compared it head to head. So we don't really know what to do with that right now. No one has established that catheter-directed uh, thrombolysis is superior to systemic th thrombolysis. How to put that clinically is to recognize that CDT is expensive, it's resource intensive, it prolongs your ICU stay, reserve it for people with high bleeding risk. So those people who are unstable, who you want to thrombolyse, but they aren't candidates for systemic thrombolysis, you may consider transferring or calling your interventionalist if you have them locally. So let's say you have the same 45-year-old man awaiting admission to the floor after a diagnosis of PE, but he didn't actually get lysis in, in the eMERGE, and he has a sudden cardiac arrest. So you feel that his arrest is due to his PE, you want to treat him. So you've started CPR, you've started your standard protocols. What do you do with him? The data on this is also fairly clear. Giving him all to place, 50 milligrams push has been studied, and uh, certainly giving him thrombolytic is recommended. The dosing is a bit controversial. I think most people would give 50 milligrams of all to place push. And this is based on a study called PPET, which was done in Arizona, where they had a remarkable uh, series of 23 patients they reported, where 23 had ROSC and survived. So, this was a retrospective review. The data quality is poor, but it seems to make sense. It's an easy dosing schedule, and that's the one that I think most people would probably endorse right now is a 50 milligram push. So someone arrests in front of you, push 50 milligrams of alteplase and uh, continue CPR. Uh, this, this author, Sharifi, is the same one who's published all the half-dose or safe-dose ly lysis studies for submassive PEs and has produced tremendous data. The data is so good that people wonder why nobody dies or bleeds in Arizona where this comes from. So that's why I think there's a little bit of skepticism about the data and, and people would like to see this replicated elsewhere. But uh, it's impressive uh, results and that's probably the strategy to use. So you have the same patient now, let's say, slightly different vitals. Uh, heart rate 96, blood pressure 100 on 55, respiratory rate 18, SAT is 96% on room air. The CT shows large clot. You believe that's causing the patient to have his symptoms. The troponin is mildly elevated. It's double the upper limit of your normal. ECG shows a sinus rhythm. So this is the patient where we're not sure what to do with. The, the biggest study in thrombolysis is PITHO, which took 1,000 patients and gave them TNK if they had a submassive PE. They defined submassive PE as a enlarged RV with signs of RV strain on CT or ultrasound, and they, they also defined it as an elevated troponin. They did not have ECG changes as part of their study protocol, but that's how they defined it. So they didn't have any kind of definition of uh, blood pressure, how sick the patient looked, other than the fact that the patient didn't qualify as a massive PE. So with Pytho, they gave all of these people thrombolytics. And what they found with Pytho in, in 2014 was uh, a lot of these people benefited, but they had a huge amount of bleeding. So they did a follow-up study then, which then went on to say, 
uh, which, which then went on to say that we're gonna follow these people three years later and say, what are we gonna do with these people three years later? What are we gonna see with their dyspnea and their mortality? And it was quite interesting. They found that about a third of them had some mild dyspnea afterwards, but only 2.5% of them had chronic thromboembolic-induced pulmonary hypertension, so a very small number. And they found that the groups that had that did not differ between the people who got thrombolytics and who didn't. So all of us who were saying, you know, if I'm an active person who's 45 and has a big clot, give me the thrombolytic even if it's not gonna save my life, but maybe it'll make me less dyspneic and give me better functional capacity, the pytho follow-up study does not show that. So we can't really say that to people now that if you have a large clot and RV strain, but you look well otherwise, that we're gonna save you from being short of breath later. That's a big change for us to think about, and that has tempered our enthusiasm to give people thrombolytics. They also found that the mortality data didn't show any benefit. The blue line that you're looking at was actually the number of people who died who got placebo, and the red line is the number of people who died who got uh, treatment, and the duration of time is, um, goes on for about three years and a bit. So, so you're, uh, they've got up to six years in, uh, at the very end, and you can see that there's really no mortality benefit that they can see. So you're, what you're describing is a study that shows no long-term mortality benefit in all comers with submassive PE. So now we're left with the fact is, what do we do now in 2018? RV strain on CT and ultrasound and troponin elevation alone is not sufficient to say that we should thrombolyze someone who looks well. That's the first thing we can say for sure. So don't thrombolyze these people who look well but are showing uh, echocardiographic signs of trouble or a troponin bump only. Keep in mind though that all of these factors, and this is a key slide, all of these factors have been shown to be independent risk factors for mortality. So if you have RV strain on ultrasound, we know that you have a several times likelihood of dying. If you have troponin elevation, that increases your risk. If your blood pressure and pulse are abnormal, that increases your risk. Shock index, which is your uh, uh, heart rate over top of your blood pressure, also will increase your risk. Increasing age, hypoxia, ECG changes, there's something called a Daniel score, which you can calculate on your ECG to tell you how abnormal your ECG is. All of those things increase your risk, as does lactate, elevation of BNP. If you have a, a residual DVT, that increases your risk of mortality. And if your cardiac reserve is low, you have CHF or COPD, that increases your mortality. So all of these things have to be factored in when you're making a decision on thrombolysis. And the pytho investigators themselves have published something in 2018. And most of the people who look at this literature feel we can probably be more selective in who we treat for uh, PE and get higher results. And basically we're saying take the sickest patients with submassive PE and treat those people. So uh, we want to try and reduce bleeding and improve our yield on thrombolytics. This number, one in 453, is the number of people who had intracranial hemorrhage when treated with half-dose thrombolytics. So if you give alteplase 50 milligrams IV instead of 100, instead of getting a 6% major bleeding rate and a 2% intracranial hemorrhage and stroke rate with, with 100 milligrams of alteplase, the risk of intracranial bleeding or major bleeding was found to be one in 453 if you pool all the data. Once again, our enthusiasm is tempered a bit by the fact that a lot of this data came from one site and needs to be replicated, but it is impressive data. So, what do we do in 2018? Thrombolyse massive PEs. So, if you see someone with a massive PE and sustained hypotension less than two, uh, a blood pressure of 90 for over 15 minutes, give them 100 milligrams of alteplase IV if you think that they have a high bleeding risk, if they're older, if you're worried about bleeding, consider giving 50 milligrams of alteplase IV. And as I said, maybe consider giving it over an hour so you can add in another 50 milligrams uh, if it hasn't worked. Secondly, someone who's arrested with a documented PE or very strong clinical suspicion, give them uh, alteplase 50 milligrams IV push. Lastly, 
don't thrombolyze patients who look well and have stable vitals, even if they qualify as a submassive, even if you see a massive saddle embolus on their CT, but you don't see anything else uh, going on clinically and they look well, don't thrombolyze those people. Watch them, admit them. Pick only the thickest of the submassives to lyse and increase your yield and decrease your bleeding by considering giving half-dose alteplase instead of full-dose alteplase. And consider interventional radiology for people who are over the age of 75, for people who look sick. Also consider an altered heparin strategy. So when we look at the studies, a lot of people think that too much heparin was given with unfractionated heparin, and that extra heparin increased the bleeding risk. Our throm uh, uh, thrombosis experts at LHSC and London Health Sciences think that we should use low molecular weight heparin, and that's what I put in the protocol that I've give to you, given to you guys, they think we should use low molecular weight heparin, which will reduce the risk of bleeding. And some of the trials have that and show better bleeding rates, but we haven't shown that prospectively. But that's what we'd recommend. And the last thing I'll say about this is, when you have something where the literature is conflicted, that's where we engage the patient and give them the options, and also engage your consultant. The last thing you want to do is make an independent decision on someone, and then have the person who you're referring the patient to then say, oh, I never would have done that. That's a horrendous situation, especially when there's clinical equipoise or some decision-making and unclear literature. So it's very helpful to engage other people in this decision, but it's useful to know what you want to do and to be able to explain it. I thank you for your attention.